I learned in all those years. I got sick and tired. I am still chafing every time someone sells help, sells, talks to me about the Help America Vote Act or the Motor Voter Act or all those things we had to implement in the state and also was given the wonderful opportunity to pay for them at the same time. Those things don't necessarily have to be there. Health care in Utah, for example, is an area in which they had, the state of Utah went on with an exchange program that was based after the unique demographics of the state of Utah. We have more kids than most of you. We also have more small businesses that don't provide insurance than most people. We need something specifically designed for Utah. If you have a one-size-fits-all program from Washington, D.C., that simply will never be there. P.J. O'Rourke once said, the mystery of government is not how it works, but how do you make it stop? <laughs> that should be our goal, and that should be our approach to things. Let me, let me finish right here and just say I, I have one ask of all of you who are here. <clears throat> I am also one of the founders of the Tenth Amendment Task Force in Washington, which means it's an effort to try and reestablish and make sure that federalism is a part of the dialogue in everything we do in Washington. On every bill that we think violates it, we want to go down there and do what we're saying now is try and plead the Tenth. So if indeed, you know, they, they want you all, every state, to set, fill out forms on what you're doing to try to encourage physical education in your states, great. Congress is not a school board. We shouldn't be doing those kind of things. It's trying to plead the tent. But I think Tom gave you the first thing I'd like to ask you to do. Quit, ask, quit asking us for more programs and money. Um, Dick Army once said, if you want to get out of the trap, you've got to let go of the cheese. <laughs> Number two, I'd like you to help us as well in Congress with the Tenth Amendment Task Force. I'd like you to encourage your congressmen to help join us. There's about 50 of us now that are part of the Tenth Amendment Task Force. I'd like you to go on my website at uh, house.gov, find me, there's three bishops, so get the right one, and then just click on the icon for the Tenth Amendment Task Force. Everything we do is in groups of ten. We're asking people to help work with us as well as other groups here by joining our Tenth Brigade. I hope you uh, would also help us with ideas. If you have come up with ideas that would be good to empower states so that states can actually stand up to Congress, we want to take those and work with you in that particular direction. I have to admit, if I were to come here and tell you that we've formed the Tenth Amendment Task Force, we have all the ideas, we know how to solve the problem, I would be doing everything I hate. We don't have all the ideas. And that's where we desperately need every private group every organized group to work with us to give us some ideas of what we can do to empower states to bring about balance between the federal government and the states, which is at the core of what the founders did when they wrote the document and what the Tenth Amendment is talking about. And with that, let me quit boring you and I'll yield to somebody else who can actually tell you what's really going on in Washington. Thank you very much. Thank you. To have you as a teacher. By the way, by the way, he is the right Congressman Bishop. Let me just say that. We really appreciate your efforts, and we're just delighted to have you there fighting the good fight. One housekeeping matter: um, we would really love to know who's here. We would love to be able to contact you with other Tenth Amendment-related issues, and so each of you has a little postcard on the desk in front of them. We hope that you'll take some time during this presentation to fill these out. Just leave them on the desk in front of you when you leave, and we will come around and collect them. And by the way, Congressman Bishop, sometimes people think that federalism doesn't work anymore. I've had the, the great pleasure several times of going to Switzerland in the last few years. Let me tell you, it does still work. Uh, I challenge you, if you ever go to Switzerland, ask the taxi driver who's the name, who is the president of Switzerland. Ask for his name. They don't know. They do not know. I've never had a taxi driver yet be able to tell me the name of the president of Switzerland. Now, if you ask them the president of their canton, Geneva or whatever, they know their local government. But they don't have a clue who the president of Switzerland is, because Switzerland has a true federal system. It's very refreshing to do that. I love to do that over there. Let me hurry up and move on to Congressman Shattuck. The main thing you need to know about Congressman Shattuck is people have been begging him to stay. He's that good. Uh, we talked him into staying a couple of years ago. Couldn't do it this time. But he's been a true champion for freedom on a whole range of issues. He's been one of the truly great guys. We're sorry to see you go. We thank you for your service. And with no further ado, please welcome Congressman John Shattuck. Um, trying to figure out if I put that down, if that'll go off. Well, if it is off, it's not the end of the world. Good morning, and thank you for being here. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to see uh, a, a, an overflowing room on this topic. 
Uh, quite frankly, when I first started talking about uh, the Enumerated Powers Act, which I'll discuss in a moment, which is my little effort to try to revive the Tenth Amendment in the United States Congress, they'd hold a seminar like this, and it'd be me, my wife, who's in the front row, honey, raise your hand, and maybe two other people. Uh, so to come here and discover this huge crowd has now discovered the Tenth Amendment, discovered that uh, contrary to what Pete Stark, think, Stark thinks, uh, the federal doesn't, government does not have unlimited powers. It cannot, at least under the provisions of the Constitution, do anything and everything it wants. Uh, it's just thrilling to see this great crowd. Uh, I am thrilled to be uh, in this room with all of you, uh, but I've got to tell you, uh, I, great panelists here that can educate you. Rob Bishop is not only uh, excessively modest, uh, he is, in fact, extremely bright, but let me ask you, how many people get to the United States Congress and write their colleagues and say, it is my goal to, ha to leave here uh, at the end of my term in Congress with the federal government and me having less power? I got a flash for you. Nobody takes that view. And yet he's absolutely right. The truth is a great deal of what is wrong in America today Indeed, a great deal of what I will argue is on the verge of destroying America today is the fact that Washington has too much power. We all know, every American knows, that that government which is closest to the people is best, and yet the trend over the lifetime of everyone in this room, including me, and I'm one of the oldest here, uh, is to move power from localities and states to the federal government and to do it uh, in, a, in a stunning rush and it must be stopped. It absolutely must be stopped. Um, he didn't be, he, he wasn't today, Rob wasn't today quite as professorial as he can be, but this is a guy who intellectually understands the deep roots of the Tenth Amendment and of the enumerated powers in the Constitution and of the limits on federal power and of the abuse of those uh, limits by the Congress uh, and the erosion of those limits by the courts. Uh, and uh, I want to tell you, that's the kind of congressman we need because the nation is about to be destroyed by what's happening. I want you to stop and think for a moment. What makes America unique? Why are we different? Why does everyone in this room say to themselves when they stop and think about it, oh my God, I am so lucky to have been born in the most unique country not only in all the world today, but in all human history. And the reason is that this country is different. Not Germany, not France, not England, not any country in Africa, not entry, any country in the Far East. No nation on the face of the earth was founded on one concept, like America, and that is a belief in the supremacy of the individual, a belief that government is enacted uh, for very limited powers, that, that, those, that, that it takes whatever power it has as a grant from the people to the government, and that it was created to forever preserve that notion of individual freedom. This is the only nation, this is the only nation in the world founded on that precept. And it's the only nation that understands that the greatest threat to that individual freedom is an excessive power, is an excessive government a massive government, and yet we've lost, we've lost sight of that. I would suggest to you that the current president, all of those around him in the White House, the current Speaker of the House and all of those around her, and the people around uh, Mr. Reid, I don't know that he thinks, I think he's just an apparatchik, um, all of the rest of them believe to the depth of their soul that what we need to do with America is emulate Europe. What we need to do with America is transfer power from individuals to an all-knowing state. That what we need to do is recognize that the government can do good for people and knows better how to run their lives than they do. And they're wrong. Now, when I said how bright Rob is and how, thankfully, he comes occasionally to the Republican conference and teaches us, I want you to understand, number one, that's unique. The reality is most of my colleagues in the United States Congress are clueless about the Constitution. They are, quite frankly, Republicans by happenstance, unfortunately, conservatives by happenstance. They wanted to get into office, and so they ran, but they ran because they're, as a Republican or a conservative because that's what you had to be where they lived. That's not Rob Bishop. Rob Bishop is an intellectual 
who understands the intellectual grounding of the things we're fighting about and who reminds them us of them. That needs to happen every day. Now, he's the professor, I'm the street fighter. What I want to tell you is go to war. Go to war, go to war, go to war. If you are not, as a member of a state legislature or an advocate in the policy arena who believes in freedom, at war with an excessive federal government that is ruining America and destroying what this nation was founded on, you're not doing your job. It's now, it's today, it's here. It's this fight. When, I got to, when Rob got to Washington, he wrote a letter to his colleagues and said, let's fight to reduce the size of the federal government. He sent them a letter, I think he'll give it to you if you're, maybe it's on his website, which said, let's find one program that's not justified under the Constitution and eliminate it. Let's find one program that doesn't belong and at least reduce it. Let's say at the end of our terms, we made Washington smaller. We returned some power to the states and to the people as we should have. But when I got there, I had an idea. I'd read the 10th Amendment, I'd read the Constitution, and I understood that we were way out of whack, that the federal government today now believes it can do anything and everything, and thank goodness, Pete Stark came out, I don't know if you saw it a couple days ago, and was asked that at a forum, and he said, yep, there are no limits on federal government power. You know what? Pete Stark is wrong, but the average American doesn't understand that he's wrong. So when I got to Washington, I introduced a simple little bill. It was killed dead as a doornail. It's been dead every term I've been there, um, and yet I reintroduce it every single year. And I will tell you, uh, it will not die. It's called the Enumerated Powers Act. When I leave Congress next January, Rob will drop it or somebody else will drop it. It's pretty radical. Uh, it says that any time a member of the United States House of Representatives or the United States Senate introduces a bill in the House or the Senate, they must recite the specific provision of the United States Constitution which empowers the federal government to enact legislation in that area. Wow. How radical. How completely radical. Let me tell you a little about its history. Uh, it, the first year I introduced it, I got 73 co-sponsors. Um, uh, I think Tom Coburn first introduced the Senate companion. I had to get Coburn elected to the Senate before he could do that. Um, by the way, what, is, what did you say? You had an iPhone? What's that? <laughs> you say you're not technically up to, up to it? Uh, I still have to get my kids to come over and turn on the VCR. No, we don't have VCRs anymore. <laughs> Um, Tom Coburn introduced it in the 110th Congress. Uh, in the 111th Congress today, it has 70 House co-sponsors and 24 Senate co-sponsors. That means there are 94 members of the United States Congress who get it, who understand that the United States Constitution provides specifically that the powers not expressly granted, expressly granted to the federal government, nor prohibited to the states, are reserved to the states or to the people, respectively. That's a huge concept. And it means that the federal government is engaged in a gazillion things that it shouldn't be engaged in. And you know what? It screws most of them up. The truth is, the Founding Fathers wanted this to be a government, the federal government to be a government of limited powers, and that it should do those things that it does do and do them well. Today, we have a national government that does everything it dreams of and does most of them quite poorly. You know whose job it means that is to change? It's your job. And I think you can do it, and I think now is the time. Let's talk a little bit about the specific powers. There are 18 of them. Uh, they are mostly in Article I, Section 8. There are things you can point your finger right to, like coin money, like conduct foreign affairs. Um, uh, and it says, the Constitution says, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. James Madison, James Madison said, the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state governments are numerous and indefinite. Those are your powers. You got to stop letting the federal government steal them from you, and it's a fight. Now I'll tell you why it's a fight. 